Welcome, everybody. My name is Barbara Triomfi. I am Executive Director at the International Press Institute, a global network of journalists and editors uh, dedicated to quality journalism, independent journalism, and the defense of press freedom. Um, welcome to the launch of our newest uh, report. It's called Around the Corner, Around the World, a global look at local news. Uh, the, the report um, and, and the link to the report will be shared soon in the chat uh, is, is about how to build uh, sustainable local journalism around the world and, and, and how local journalism can be a key tool in the fight against the disinformation. Um, the, um, the report is the outcome uh, of um, many months of research carried out by my colleague, Jackie Park, who is IPI uh, Head of um, Network Strategy and Innovation. And she, over the past months, uh, spoke to many editor, publishers, uh, journalists working at um, local news uh, on four different continents, many different countries, uh, and really tried to grasp what are the lessons learned, what are their strategies to ensure that, um, you know, the, the, the journalism they do is supporting the, 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 the communities that they serve, and what can we learn, what are the lessons learned, and also, also very much what are the needs and how can we ensure that these needs are fulfilled. So, First of all, I will start with some uh, questions uh, for, with, with for Jackie to describe, to, to talk a little bit about the report and the findings. And then we are joined today by five great uh, panelists who also contributed to the study. We have two panelists from um, India, Mira Kay, who is co-founder and editor of Citizen Matters. Hi, Mira. Um, Raga uh, Kartikeyan who is editor for special projects and experiments at the News Minute, also in India. Hi, Raga. We have two speakers from the US, Dana Kesta, editor-in-chief of 100 Days in Appalachia, and Sarah Alvarez, the founder and editor of Outlier Media. And finally, our uh, speaker from Spain is Tomas Garcia, who's chief digital officer of La Voz de Galicia. Welcome. And uh, please feel free to share your questions uh, in the chat. We will have uh, time to, to take them and um, we look forward to uh, a, a conversation on this. But let me start with you, Jackie. Uh, tell hi. us, hi, and uh, tell us a little bit about um, the report. Basically, what did we find out? Is there any similarity in the experiences of local media in the different parts of the globe that you have uh, been yes. the with. Okay, thanks, thanks, Barbara. Thanks for the introduction. So what, um, you know, it's been fascinating to conduct what I think is the first globally comparative look at local news media around the world. And I'm really pleased to have, you know, with a, such a diverse group of newsroom leaders um, who can share their perspectives and, you know, whose perspectives we've tried to capture in the report. So what I might do, Barbara, is just um, go through what I see as some of the highlights from the report and then bring in, um, you know, Sarah and uh, Dana, Mira, uh, Thomas and, and Raga to provide a kind of more complete view of the, of the research and the findings. So, you know, as we know, the, the changing habits of audience and advertisers means that Local media is really, you know, I think, you know, the most disrupted sector of, of the media, of the media industry. And as we know, it's our communities and the democracy that has really been paying the price. So that's why managing local news through the digital transition is really one of the biggest challenges that we face now in journalism. <clears throat> but from my perspective, I would say, luckily, disruption can also be another word for opportunity. And, you know, I've been excited by what I've found talking to local media builders around the world. They are centering their communities to serve their needs with a clear mission, experimenting with accessible journalism formats, products that 
find their community where they are and diverse business models that you know really I think are pointing to you know sustainability certainly holding out that promise and really what I found is that they're they're rethinking everything um, and they're finding ways to make it sustainable so this report if if you like it's it's a real time qualitative report based on in-depth discussions with more than 30 journalists, editors, media leaders, and entrepreneurs from 20 media organizations, either transitioning legacy media or building new, new digital media voices. And they're from across the United States, Asia, the Pacific, Africa, and Europe. And while in all countries and regions, we found like there's a there's a common sense of um, there's a common sense of mission to serve communities with great journalism. The digital transition infrastructure to support media, and the level of of networking and you know national and regional networking that goes with it, as well as that kind of knowledge sharing conversation that goes on between people doing the work. Well, that's what is not evenly available and this actually makes a world of difference so think of this report as a as a kind of thank you part report back to those who've joined the conversation and part a stab at a global leveling up of the wisdom that they have shared so we found some big questions that shaped our report and i've got six of them that i just want to run through the first, first question that I guess I went into it with was really, you know, what even is local media? What does it mean? And across countries and regions, local news media meant different things. So in, say, India, it could mean news media reaching 100 million people across several states. In Southern California, it could mean, you know, the 25-odd million people who live in greater Los Angeles. Or it could mean the 10,000 or so people living in the Val de Felice in Italy's Piedmont region. Or it could be small country towns in the mastheads gathered together in Australian community media. Now, last century, the differences generated by size were often greater than the similarities. Now, no matter how large the audience, News outlets that target geographically constrained audiences have more to learn from each other than not. The second question was, you know, why is local media particularly disrupted? And well, it turns out that actually there's just a lot of it to be disrupted. Um, Pre-internet, you know, if anyone can remember back that far, news media was optimized for local, high capital costs, Geographic distribution gave the local media an unassailable edge that meant they dominated the news market. But now the internet rewards news media that scales at a national or even a transnational level. And that's been great for big voices, particularly in the traditional news centres like New York or London. It's made, it's been made, it's made them stronger, relatively at least, at the same time as local media has been weakened. But all that is forcing us to rethink how do we make news and journalism relevant and necessary at the local level and figure out what products and business models can make the journalism sustainable. And so how do the challenges differ among local media? And there's a few, and I'm, I'm just gonna share three here. First of all, and I mentioned it in the opening, it's the unequal access to transition support institutions and infrastructure. And that's things like universities, NGOs, uh, philanthropic agencies, early movers, the tech platforms and parent corporations. That's all much more accessible in, in North America, particularly, and also in Europe than it is say in Asia or Africa. The other, um, the other big um, you know, difference is that the revenue shift from advertising to reader revenues, it risks entrenching the digital divide between wealthy communities and low-income cities and regions. 
And this is a challenge that many media are trying to figure out. How do you keep your journalism accessible to those who need it? And the third part of this um, question is that traditional media bring accumulated loyalty, and that's good, but they also bring legacy production and subscription costs, which may not be so good. Whereas new media start up from scratch on both counts. And so each of, those, each of them needs to understand how that strength and weakness impacts what they're trying to do. The fourth question was, how has it changed the journalism and what's working? And to me, this really is the most fascinating question. And we look at the range from Italy's La Ora del Police that goes deep, but for a very small community, or deep Detroit's outlier media that uses an information on demand texting model to deliver journalism as a service. Generally, I found it means a journalism that fills a news or information need or a gap. And the demand for engaged readership requires a new way of thinking about journalism beyond news reporting. It requires a journalism that holds institutions to account and provides difficult to access information as a service rather than reporting for the record. Uh, and crime, I found, you know, it's just one of the most fascinating subjects on which this change pivots tilting power really on its head. Where once crime was reported from an institutional, largely policing lens, local media, well, not, not all, but most of the ones that I spoke to actually find now that they're reporting it much more from an audience perspective. Many reported that they just do not cover crime, but they do cover policing and power. And so it's clear in the journalism that this shake-up of local news is really driving news media to create a more socially useful, more engaged, and a really a much better journalism for our communities. So the fifth question is, what's working on the business side? And successful local media are supported in some way by their local community and their audience. And they understand that reader revenues and audience engagement are two sides of the same coin. And that community engagement is now really central to the, to the business. Now, this is more than just direct reader payments in their differing forms, like from subscriptions and paywalls to memberships and donations. It means diversified revenues. It means thinking smartly also about how advertising can build more engagement through sponsorship, for example. And finding other ways that your community, including the businesses in your community, can support you. And, uh, and something all had in common was that they were finding smart ways to talk to their communities about why they needed their support. And the, the last question was, does local media have a special role in countering this information? And this was one of the big questions that we went into the research with because we wanted to understand you know, how, important, how important was that and how were, um, how were media organisations doing it. And in the report, you know, we give, a, we, we give you know, detail around the different ways that people are doing it. But, but really there's a, there's a, a manichaeism in information right now. Journalism face-to-face -face with disinformation and misinformation. And the trust that the connectedness of local media builds puts news media in the center of the battle against misinformation and disinformation by fact-checking, deep reporting and debunking disinformation and misinformation. You know, we saw, you know, everything from, um, you know, Mahoning Matters, you know, when, when it was, said on Facebook that Antifa had taken over the Walmart, you know, downtown, where they went down and actually reported from there, you know, did live reporting on Facebook and, you know, on, on their site, you know, saying, like, look, we're here, nothing's happening, you know, to really kind of detailed um, uh, fact-checking that 100 Days does that, that Dana can tell us about in a minute. 
So in talking to journalists, editors, and media builders around the world, we found that everyone who was managing the transition had, fa had found answers to one or more of these questions that worked for them. And well, as you know, we've got some of them here. So I'm gonna ask each of them to share you now some of their experiences, you know, and, and that will help illuminate the report. So I might um, start with Dana, with you, Dana, and uh, who done as the editor-in-chief of 100 Days in Appalachia. And it really started as a, as a kind of a pop-up media experiment, right? For 100 days. And it's still here, so you must be doing something right. And so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what, who your audience is, um, you know, what you're doing and what you've learned. Sure. And I also wanted to, I have my executive editor, Ashton Mara, here with us. So um, I may throw a part of this to her. Um, yeah, so we launched um, the day after the 2016 election um, with a very assertive, um, mission of creating a counter narrative for the region, which had been um, very narrowly or or flat out misrepresented um, in, by national and international um, media. And um, I, I actually had followed the uh, I'm a, I was a big fan of Zach Seward, who launched um, courts, um, which had a sort of singular mission, a sense of self um sort of came out the door you know with an assertive personality and we um worked with um we actually brought in um their growth editor to advise us in in our launch and and one of the things that i really liked about um that model was it's not just about saying who you are it's also saying what you're not and so we were really clear about saying you know we are not a you know, a newspaper of the daily record, you know, we don't do this, we don't do this. Um, and then um, sort of defining ourselves and, and the the gaps uh, as your your entire report um, is about. Um, we were also really aggressively collaborative um, because we weren't the only, you know, digital startup in the region. There are amazing, amazing startups and, and small um, publishers uh, uh, throughout our region that we immediately reached out to and looked at ways of um, sharing resources from and, and co-publishing together or sharing content. Um, and uh, so we did that and, and also um, facilitated um, new partnerships. We also wanted to make sure that local news outlets in our region didn't see us as a competitor, which which we weren't. Um, we were, we wanted to amplify any local news at all to an external audience. Our audience, you know, initially was targeting um, the rest of the, the nation and the rest of the world. Um, but that actually helped create sort of our sustainability model because we had so much community engagement so much, um, it, we only use Appala mostly only use Appalachian media makers. And, um, and because we had so much audience engagement and community engagement as part of our outward facing message, that also created a, a lot of ownership that we're seeing in our, in our readership campaigns that we're doing now because um, we have, uh, we have like so many people and a lot of young people, which we're really excited about because um, that's that's such a um, important audience for sustainability, um, giving really small amounts, but at scale is something that's going to help us um, help us survive. And I wanted to see if Ashton could really quick talk about um, uh, initiative she did, the Appalachian Advisors Network, which I think is also part of that sense of ownership for the region. I'll, I'll try to keep it really brief, but we did launch um, in the fall our Appalachian Advisors Network, which is a three prong kind of project. Um, the first part of it is creating a database of Appalachian freelancers, creatives who work in all platforms, not just writers and photographers and videographers, but um, poets and researchers and sculptors and painters who are available for hire. And our goal with that element was 
to get people from within Appalachia hired to tell stories. Instead of parachute journalism, we said, here are a group of people that are readily available to do this work for you on the ground. Um, our second prong of that project was a set of essentially how to and how to not cover Appalachia, a set of guides, um, very, very short and brief quick things like if you want to come cover coal in central Appalachia, these are the couple of bullet points you should know before you get here. Or if you're coming to cover education, here is that one podcast that maybe you could listen to on the way or a couple of articles that you could read. Basically knowing that we can't stand on the borders of the region and keep the New York Times or the Washington Post out, but we could maybe help them do a little bit better job when they get here. Um, and then the third prong, which is the biggest, is um, our Appalachian advisors themselves. And so we hired, I mean, we pay them. They are um, 13 people in eight of the Appalachian states who are readily available to speak to members of the media. They have agreed to be official sources to talk on the record, but they're also kind of um, resource brokers, if that makes sense. They are ready to give reporters context before they start reporting um, to help them make connections with people on the ground and to overall just strengthen the reporting on Appalachia. Mm, great. And and that's that's because when you launched, you launched as much to talk to your community, to report for your community, as to report, as to represent them, to properly represent them as they would like to be represented. Yeah. Donna, can you just tell us quickly about the business model? You were, it was initially mostly grants, but now you're working on reader revenues. Yeah, so we, we launched um, with the support of um, a community foundation grant who gave us seed funding. Uh, we were also incubated in a university uh, media innovation center. Um, and we also had partnerships with uh, West Virginia Public Broadcasting and um, another amazing digital outlet called the Daily Yonder um, out of Kentucky. And um, we, we also started very lean. You know, we, we, have, we sort of swell to our funding availability, but we also have kind of our core, you know, what we call our minimum viable product. I think that's really important for any outlet to have that. I think outlets that are startups that start too big are getting themselves in, into trouble when it, when it comes to sustainability. So we were sort of, we were able to grow into, um, into revenue, of course, with, with the support of grants to start. And then um, we are now in that, uh, we, we've started, uh, we participated in Newsmatch, which is a US campaign where uh, local outlets that are a nonprofit, also we're a nonprofit model, sorry, um, do um, reader uh, campaigns and member um, campaigns and a, um, some funders throw in some match for that here in the US. Um, and we're working with something called Table Stakes, which is a, a cohort of outlets that are all diverse outlets from all kinds of different models um, that are working on um, their sustainability uh, model. And we're in the, the middle of that now and um, yeah. things, things look good, but, but we're also, we're a very lean operation. We're, we're really small. Okay, and, and just lastly, um, because misinformation, combating misinformation is obviously really important for, for your mission. So, I mean, ha where, what have you found there? What have you learned? What success have you had? Sure, so that, that's core to, to um, several of our, our verticals that, that we do. One is covering extremism in the region and what the sources of that are, which mis and disinformation very much plays into that among many other historical um, and uh, factors. Um, the other, uh, you know, we immediately launched a vertical to cover um, COVID, but also misinformation around COVID um, regionally. Um, and we have a partnership, one of our collaborating partners is PolitiFact. So we work with them on doing, um, on publishing, co-publishing and also distributing uh, fact-checking um, for the region. 
Okay, great. Um, Mira, Mira, Mira is the co-founder of Citizen Matters in um, in in India. Now, initially, it was founded in in uh, Bangalore. Bangalore. Yeah, yeah, and it's a local media that empowers communities to engage in finding solutions for their own city. So you launched in two thousand and eight. Obviously, a lot has changed since there, and we don't have time, unfortunately, to go through that. But you started not as a for profit magazine. Mm -hmm. You're now not for profit online. Can you just tell, tell me, uh, tell us a bit about the gap you're filling? Like, what kind of what gap did you see? And I know your journalism has changed a little bit um, more recently. The way you approach the journalism. Sure. So um, we kind of define ourselves as a, as an urban knowledge exchange platform now, right? So it's not just pure journalism. We are beyond that. We have civic media, we have data, especially open data, and we have the citizen engagement. So together, we kind of looking to see how we can empower citizens to kind of build better cities. So we see our, ourselves as sort of like a catalyst. And, and of course, our, our areas of focus are pretty like very, very clear. We look at things that uh, you know, cause the daily pain points that citizens face, right? In in terms of uh, commute and public safety, and you know, air quality, water issues, waste management, you know, the typical stuff, like day to day stuff. Um, and so people kind of understand this, and and you, you know, they they realize that the, here is this credible source of information, not just information, but also explanation. So we kind of try to connect the dots and you know, add that perspective. So uh, one is it at a macro level you know, which explains how the system works, right? Because many of these issues, like while you may see a pothole, these are actually a systemic issue. Why do they come again and again? It's the, the way it's related to the, you know, the, to the roads, to the contract system, everything. Um, plus we also kind of provide uh, information at a my, with a micro perspective, which is that what is it that you as a citizen can do today, right? If you want a better road, this is how you can you can use the Right to Information Act to find more information, or you can use here is actual process by which a road is built, and this is what you can you know keep track of this and so on. So uh, with that, you know, multiple at both levels, both at the macro and the micro level, we're trying to get people to be the change makers, right? And and mm. we focus, uh, we don't worry so much about the break breaking news, the daily news. Uh, this is more like sort of long form, deeper focus stuff. And we focus on this, the, the why and the how, right? Why is this, uh, why are these issues there and how is it that we can fix them? Right? So that's, I, I, I suppose is the, you know, what differentiated yeah. between the regular mainstream media and the way we approach stuff. And we're very collaborative that way in the sense we work a lot with citizens, you know, not just plain bone citizen journalism. We started with that, right? Right from the early days, we realized that people have a lot of, um, um, a lot of understanding, especially in a, in a first hand experience of what's happening in their communities. Like I think somebody talked about parachuting journalists, right? It's not just from New York to Appalachia, but even, uh, you know, having somebody from, let's say the, the, center part of the city going to an out, outer suburb, you really don't know what the issues are in that particular, let's say, neighborhood, right? So it's important to bring, to provide space to those people from those communities. So which is why we get a lot of citizens, but we work with them, we mentor them, we facilitate and help them kind of, you know, get their um, learning across literally those mm -hmm. learnings and insights that the community has. So yeah, that's I mean, been our approach, yeah. And and just quickly, how how are you funded? Because I know that's that's been developing as well. Right, right. Yeah, like you mentioned, we started as a for profit, but we realized that you know, uh, you know, there's a typical like advertising based model, but we realized soon that really not uh, sustainable enough. Um, especially the kind of journalism we were doing, which is like really deep diving journalism requires a lot of effort and time and money, obviously. So then we moved to a nonprofit model where we now depend on, we do have reader funding. So like, you know, typical uh, media, uh, nonprofit media, uh, twice a year we go around with like a begging poll saying, please do donate support without your, you know, uh, contributions, this can't continue so on. Uh, but but we also have like uh, HNIs and philanthropists supporting as well as some grants and foundations. So it's like a combination of uh, uh, multiple sources. Yeah. So wait, high net worth individuals, like big donors, yeah. individual yeah. donors. Okay, right. great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and 
Sarah, Sarah Alvarez is the founder and editor of Outlier Media in Detroit. And Outlier is, is such an interesting model. Um, you know, journalism as a service by text, and it's really quite a radical rethink of the journalism product, right? And, and also of the audience, you know, and, and what, what their needs are. Can you tell us, tell us a bit about, you know, how you came to the model and what gap you're filling? And what have you learned? Sure. A lot. <laughs> um, uh, hello, everybody. I was going to say good morning, but I think it's only good morning for a few of us. So, um, yeah, outlier. I mean, I do think it's important to say, like, yes, I think we're very innovative in the news space. I don't know that we are super innovative in general, but I think the news space is a place where there's just not a lot of innovation. Um, and where people just really like to hew closely to what has been um, done before. So, but, you know, um, we're also super collaborative. I think the approach that I, you know, came from, I was a lawyer first. And so I really brought that kind of client centered idea to journalism as well, right? Like, what are we supposed to be doing? Who are we supposed to be doing it for? Um, and really wanting to serve people specifically, not just like in general serving the audience. Um, and then I was in public media, but I was a little bit disappointed by the lack of desire, I think, to truly serve the public <clears throat> here in America. Public media tends to focus on <clears throat> higher income individuals as their audience and really prioritize those folks. So I think what's different about Outlier is that it's a pretty targeted approach and it's more of like, like almost like a public health approach to public media. I have a background in public health um, and that's what we're trying to do, right? Where you have more of an interventionist approach. And so in Detroit, it is a city where we're super lucky to have still local news infrastructure. We have two papers still, we have a public radio station, we have um, smaller press, but it doesn't serve Detroit. It's more serves the uh, more wealthy surrounding suburbs. So people in Detroit do not have their information needs met. And what Outlier is trying to do is say like, let's be strategic, let's figure out what is the most important thing that news has to do. And to us here in this ecosystem, it is filling information gaps. And then how do you identify high value information to fill those gaps? And how do you get it to people in the way that they uh, need it? And I really take this model of looking at the ecosystem pretty far and trying to assess what's already there and like where we can where we can be valuable. And here in this ecosystem, we need information gap filling and we need investigative work. And our SMS system really works as a an engine for the investigative and accountability work that we do. So all of those leads really do come from the SMS system. We also run City Bureau's Documenters program, which if you haven't, if you're not familiar with that, it's a great program where people get paid to cover city meetings and then to take notes and we edit those notes and we make them publicly available. But that's like a, another huge driver of our coverage. And importantly to the stuff about like business model, it gives us an audience that is not already very proximate to power or money right? Like our documenters are our elite audience that we are serving and they're not rich people. They're engaged people. They're not activists. They're engaged people. They're not powerful people in like more so than most people. Um, and like, I think the thing about the business side, I mean, God, so it's, there's like no good answers for this, right? Like we're lucky in Detroit and in the United States to have access to philanthropic money. We started with philanthropic money, um, and which was not a lot, like it was $70,000 for a year. And that was our first two years. And, but that's like a lot of money still, right? You know, that's a lot of money to just be able to do whatever you want to do with it. So we had, we were lucky to start that way, but we really took the first five years, Outliers five years old now, 
uh, to build a really good product. And now we're starting to build like the kind of business infrastructure because there's no good answers for this, right? Like there's, it's like schools. Like, how are you gonna like, there's no margins there. So I wanna engage in those kind of conversations. I know we can do better. It was cool seeing like Block Club Chicago in the report, they're like amazing at, um, at revenue. Well, what we've tried to do is like focus on cost sharing with our other media partners here and then revenue generation again with our other media partners here. Like we're working on a co-op to take care of that cost sharing stuff. And then the revenue, we're doing all the things that everybody else is doing. Um, but I do think it's important to be like, it's, there's no real, you know, we're lucky to get by always. Great, thank you. That was a really good um, explanation. Uh, Thomas Garcia Moran. Thomas, are you with us? Yeah, hello, yes. how are you? Hi. Hi. Uh, Thomas is the Chief Digital Officer for La Voz de Galicia. And it's 130 years, 130 years old, I think. Uh, and what, you were early to go- 140, yeah. 140, okay, you were early to go online. And in Spain, you were one of the first to move to the digital subscriptions model in 2019. And, and you've told me that that's a model that has really paid off for you. It's been successful both in terms of revenue, you're getting there, but it's actually been really successful in terms of your journalism, because it's made you think about that. Can you tell us about that? And what are you, what are you still to learn? What are you learning? What are you still to learn? Okay, yeah, this is the, the, main, the main thing from in this journey, what we are learning. Uh, we have been uh, doing journalism for, uh, for, for, for many years, uh, but we have been doing, let's say, e-commerce for the last uh, two years. So this is something uh, completely new for us. So, um, okay, so first of all, I will try to explain in, 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 a, in a couple of minutes who we are. We are... Uh, a uh, broadsheet newspaper uh, founded almost 140 years ago. Uh, we are based in Galicia, which is uh, northwest coast of Spain. This is uh, a place where we are 2.7 million people. And uh, Sara.com, our next block to us. Uh, we are in the corner of Europe, but we have strong uh, neighbors as, as the headquarters of, of uh, Sara uh, worldwide. Uh, as a newspaper, we have always had a, a singular model. It's not that we are a hyper-local uh, newspaper, a regional newspaper, a national or a global newspaper. We try to be all of that. And um, well, uh, uh, yesterday was a very, very sad day for us because you probably heard about David Beriain who was killed in Burkina Faso uh, yesterday with to, together with a camera, okay, who was our uh, war correspondent for six years. He was not working with us anymore, but he started with us, uh, with our, in, 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 in my team, he was a very good friend of, of mine. So uh, we always had, I always tell, tell the story that La Bote Galicia interviewed uh, Fidel Castro in Sierra Maestra. We have always mm, been worried about what's going on all over the world and have to have try to explain the world to Galician readers, right? So uh, we are four most read newspaper in Spain, third biggest, uh, if we talk about uh, circulation, about uh, uh, 52K copies every day. We are second more trust uh, news source after El País, according to Spanish Sociological Research Center. Uh, we have a almost 30,000 print edition subscribers. Um, and if we talk about our, um, let's say all KPIs, we have 14 million uh, monthly unique browsers. Uh, and again, we are 2.7 million people living in Galicia. We have 80 million monthly page views. And we have the, the reason why we have this uh, huge amount of traffic is because we have two languages. One is Galician, which is spoken for 3.3 million people, a little more, a bit more than 3 million people. And the other is the Spanish language, which as you know, is uh, spoken by 
almost 600 million people. Uh, we like to say that no Galician citizen lives more than 25 kilometers from a La Voz de Galicia journalist. We are 200, 240 people working in the newsroom. Uh, the biggest part of them are not in the central newsroom, but on local newsrooms uh, on the field in, in one of our 13 different uh, local editions. So what we have done in the last two years, first, first of, all, of that, we had to mm, take the decision to go uh, behind a paywall. Uh, we realized that it is impossible to compete about, uh, I mean, with Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. And uh, we are, uh, our, our industry, we are the weakest link in the value chain, right? Uh, our affairs, uh, we uh, ad adopt a business model, uh, trying not to lose reach or reduce our digital advertising revenue. We, we couldn't we couldn't do that. We already had a, a business med model, a digital uh, advertising model. Uh, we couldn't kill this. I mean, uh, so we, 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 we said, okay, we cannot go down in the audience. We cannot go down in the, in the advertising, advertising revenue. Uh, so our decision after, after looking a lot to the Nordic model, was that uh, the change comes from the from within the newsroom? I mean, uh, we had a lot of journalists who were used to write our articles with a huge audience on Charbit, and we had to ch to, to 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 make this uh, transformation and uh, to uh, to do that together with the journalist. I am a journalist. My CEO is a journalist. I have been working in Labo de Galicia for the last twenty three years. So. Uh, this was the, 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 the most difficult thing to do. Our model, uh, initially we started with a metered paywall two years ago, April 2019. In that moment, the two biggest newspapers in Spain, which are El País and El Mundo, were still totally open. Uh, in September, we have a hybrid model. So in September uh, 2019, we started closing content, premium content, uh, small stories, small local stories. Uh, one year ago, uh, uh, we were in the, in the middle of the state of alarm in, in Spain with the, with the coronavirus. Uh, and we made a new change, which, which was uh, to change from a transactional model to an emotional model. I'm not talking about uh, membership or subscription. It, we, we didn't kill the subscription, but we changed the, the the copies, the messages, etc. And uh, the last change was uh, in December. We we'll launch our annual subscription, and we increase the price uh, uh, forty percent. So, as you as you said, Jackie, with what we have learned so far. For, first, we we what we achieved are over two thousand uh, digital, digital subscribers. Uh, half of them are digital, digital only. And the other, the rest are uh, people coming coming from the print uh, edition. Uh, already twenty percent of them are annual subscribers. Uh, we have increased in twenty four months. We have increased our um, our audience forty nine percent, and our page views fourteen percent. Which is, I think, it um, has to do a lot with the coronavirus, but also what. With, with, with this change that we implement in the newsroom with new reporting and uh, everything. So uh, I would say we have learned three things. First is that it's better to start walking and make mistakes. Uh, we didn't wait until everything was ready. We started and we started without El País and El Mundo in, uh, running the same business. Um, second thing is that, uh, well, at least in our case, Price elasticity is very low. I mean, we we uh, increase our price forty percent, and nothing happened to us, right? And uh, the third thing is, and I this this last thing is the one I feel uh, prouder about is journalists are happier when they get twenty new subscriptions with a quality article than when they had 
one million unique browsers. Uh, we had we have to change this this mentality in the newsroom, but I, I think we have we are in the good way to to get it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thanks. And uh, Raga, Raga Malika from the News Minute in India, which is just an incredible media organization. And uh, so, so yeah, tell, tell us about it. Covers five states, I think so many millions of people. Um, it has a feminist perspective. Danya, the founder, has told me before. And I know that you've been figuring out, you know, the, your business model. And so I know that's what you're working on. If you can tell us a little bit about the News Minute and where are you going with the reader revenues? Thanks, Jackie. And uh, thanks, everyone. It was uh, really interesting to listen to all of your stories and uh, like, you can find like common themes of what we're all working on. Uh, so the News Minute was started in 2014. Um, because uh, there was a, um, we felt that, uh, I mean, our founders felt that there was a, a gap in uh, reporting South India. So India is huge, right? Like it's probably the size of Europe and you have like states which are all divided uh, on the basis of language. And uh, usually our like so-called national media in English is um, located either in like Delhi or Bombay and the way they look at the rest of the country is like oh these are satellites like standing somewhere there and uh, the reporting is also like that like you have journalists sitting in Delhi and Bombay and talking about the rest of the country so South India and uh, Northeast India and like some of the other regions are not well represented in these uh, national discourses so uh, when uh, TNM was started when the news minute was started uh, we decided that we will focus on the five states in the south of India um, and again, obviously, I'm not saying that the five states collectively have like one single identity. That's not the case. I mean, every state in India has like a different identity, different culture. But we decided that we will report from the ground um, with journalists who are from that region, who understand the region, who understand the language, who understand the culture, the food, uh, the politics, um, you know, the, the caste, class divides, like, you know, people who understand that region should be the ones reporting from that region and not like... Um, parachuting in from Delhi or Bombay or wherever. Uh, so that was the reason uh, TNM was started in 2014. And I joined like um, a little later, I joined like 2017. Um, and uh, we basically have seen a very good response to our approach to news, right? Like we um, cover politics, we cover general news, we cover crime, we do all of that from South India uh, with a uh, you know, uh, a proper South India perspective. And uh, as Jackie said, I mean, we've realized like over a period of time that, you know, we can't just be saying that um, covering news is five W's and one H and that you just like put it out there and you forget about it. Uh, so we realize that, you know, when we have a perspective and we have a feminist perspective and we have a progressive perspective to news, it does reflect well with the readers. Uh, they do want to like sort of see that. Um, so whether it's like entertainment reporting, where our reviews, for instance, um, Soumya Rajendran, our features and entertainment editor, she does a lot of reviews and it's always sort of away from this thing of, you know, oh, this is what is in the movie and that's it. Like, you know, she does look at it from a gender lens and that sort of forced a lot of other people to do that. It's forced a lot of other people to like follow that example. Um, crime stories, for instance, uh, you know, uh, we see a lot of newspaper headlines, for instance, they'd say, um, a woman killed her husband uh, because he was bald uh, or some, you know, ridiculous headline like that. And uh, it's important to also understand the ecosystem, right? You have a lot of male journalists who are crime journalists and they're all very in with the police. They're very pally with the police. So they print whatever the police tells them. Um, so we decided, I mean, when we saw the headline, our team was like, okay, this sounds ridiculous, right? Like this can't be the reason for a murder. So, uh, we have a woman editor, we have most of our uh, journalists are women. So they decided to like dig a little deeper and they just had to make a couple of phone calls to find out that this was actually an issue of marital rape and not, you know, some ridiculous, oh, he was bald, so she went and killed him kind of, you know, nonsense narrative that uh, people want to present. Uh, so that's been our approach. We sort of dig deep. We make sure that, you know, stories are done properly with the right perspective and not just like, you know, print whatever, the police say or whatever the authorities are ready to tell us at the drop of a hat uh, so we go a little deeper into everything and we bring 
a proper local perspective to everything so that's been our approach to journalism um as far as the business side goes we've been um advertising uh centered for a very long time but uh, for the past couple of years we've been talking about starting a membership program and um we were waiting for uh, the google news initiative uh, funding and all of that last year when uh, the pandemic hit and uh, as i'm sure happened to uh, a lot of media houses across the world our revenues were hit really badly so we decided that okay i mean yeah like uh, thomas said that you know it's not it's not necessary to be like completely ready with everything we just decided to take the plunge and say okay we're starting a membership program uh, we were very honest with our readers we said hey guys like we're not ready with it we don't have i mean we want to start a forum space for you we want to start this we want to start that we don't have all of that ready what we are giving you right now uh, as part of the membership program is a, a newsletter so we started with one newsletter um but people were very responsive and uh, we see that because uh, most of our members are uh, on a yearly plan uh, so uh, like right now we are on the uh, like because we started like uh, at the end of april last year beginning of may so everybody is on like most of them are on renewal right now so that's our next challenge but people were very responsive and they said i mean we had a fixed uh, pay plan we said okay 999 rupees a year and you can be a member for one year and then a lot of people came back and said you know what i can pay more uh, so there was one person who decided to buy out memberships for like everybody she knew because she had the money to afford uh, but you know we didn't have a plan to match what she was willing to give and there were others who said listen i can't afford this much right i can't be uh, paying this much but i do want to support you in some way so then we decided to like i mean we were not initially we went in with a plan but we were willing to sort of say okay we've experimented and this is not working this may work better so let's just like move into that um in september we start opened out the membership to our uh, diaspora because uh, very frankly i mean you guys in the us and europe earn much more than we do in india so you have to keep up pockets so we wanted to like sort of tap into that a little bit and say you know you do care about the people who do care about like what's happening back home in india uh, you should be contributing as well uh, which is doing decently but it's still the readers in india who are in this situation who are more willing to support uh, independent media uh, so yeah and now we are sort of expanding our thinking uh, from like just membership to think of it as reader revenue um, and uh, think about like you know how we can Uh, there may be some members who want to give more uh, for a certain project or uh, you know somebody who wants to just give like 10 rupees which may not be much but it's still important for us to know that there is this person who wants to support us and like you know um, show that in whatever small way they want to uh, and we've sort of realized that uh, i mean the advertising pa- uh, side aside like the business pa- the advertising business i am not really involved with that but for the membership reader revenue um we realized that like reader engagement is member engagement is really important so what we've been doing again like i mean every uh, sort of every month we come up with like every new ideas so we we have like uh, a monthly editorial meeting where members are invited and we have a lot of members coming in with like great ideas and uh, you know some members and reporters are collaborating on stories or if uh, you know if a reporter comes up with an idea and a member has like some perspective on it they've been working in public health for instance and somebody's talking about covid and they can bring in their perspective maybe not on record they can't give you a quote on record but they can give you their like lived experience so those are the kinds of things that are happening and we've been doing like online events with this obviously pandemic and membership we always thought we were going to do events uh, so we have taken all of that online now so we do zoom events uh, we've done events with politicians we've done events with singers um, and uh, if for members it's it's great to be able to like sort of speak to them directly right so we give them them an opportunity to like you know ask questions to these news makers uh, so we are engaging our members and we are hoping that that sort of synergy between reader revenue and engagement like sort of continues and uh, we can build on that um yeah so i don't know if this was like really scattered but right that's that's great and and i think it, i think it's really interesting how once you open open up you know you open that door to to your readers either you know through as members and you bring them into your events or your editorial meetings how that can then lead to other kind of collaborations and engagements yeah so that, absolutely and we've seen like a lot of sorry a lot of members who have become like regular contributors uh, in the last year yeah. so it's been great yeah 
Okay, so, um, so, so there's one question from Corinne Podger. Hi, Corinne. Uh, so, so Corinne says, what is, what's the editor management mindset, you know, that, that it's driven financial su sustainability for local news organisations during the pandemic? And what does that mean? Like, what is that strategy? Who would like to take that? I'll start. I mean, we like we're not <laughs> we're very small, right? So financial sustainability for us means something really different than for you know um, Tomas, for example. But I think for a small news organization, I think the mindset for us has always been like we need to hang on long enough until people understand what we're doing. We need to do it as well as we can until some people understand what we're doing, right? Like we're not gonna go chase stuff. We're not gonna say like, maybe this is the way, maybe this is, um, this is the new thing. We're just like, we're doing our thing. Hopefully we'll be lucky enough to be around when people understand what it is we're doing. And that's what happened to us with the pandemic because we've been talking about information gaps and how destructive they are and how severe they are and how essential it is to fill them for since we started. And until COVID, people who didn't live in those every day really did not understand what we were about. Once COVID hit and everybody could feel like, not everybody, but like rich people could feel what it feels like to be in an information gap they understood what we were trying to do and how it affects people every day. And that's when things changed for us in terms of philanthropic support, finally understanding that like what we're doing is not, um, you know, has broader implications, I think. So that's like, but again, sustaining us is a lot easier than sustaining a lot of other news organizations. Okay, so I just want to, don't go, Mira. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add like a slightly uh, different perspective because especially in India, one of the challenges has been the last year has been very tough, not just for media, for everybody else, Roy, right? And and uh, during the pandemic and we had the lockdowns and we had a lot of uh, like migrant workers um, finding it challenging and there was a lot of um, philanthropic wo um, initiatives were focused on actually providing relief, providing like healthcare and so on. So a lot of money actually went there while media did very well in terms of you know reach and in in numbers and page views and whatnot but the actual like the funding that came to media i think was definitely challenging in the last year so that's just another perspective yeah yeah and i just can i uh, thomas yeah so so i mentioned before that we had to change everything with the COVID. as you as you know we i mean uh, spain was one of the European ground zero of the of the pandemic, uh, we we didn't have, uh, uh, and maybe we still don't have like um, uh, a model uh, like a, a, a long term uh, subscription a reader revenue model. Uh, so uh, when when I mean first of March, uh, we had three point five uh, thousand. Uh, uh, subscribers, El País, which is the biggest newspaper in Spain, had all, had just started in that moment, and I, I mean it was very difficult for them. Obviously, everybody uh, started to say uh, this must be for free. We are in the middle of a big uh, crisis, etc. Uh, so we had to to change a little bit. We we put the the content. Uh, the the pandemic content out out of the metered uh, paywall, but we uh, I mean we we keep the paywall and we keep a closing content which was uh, really useful for the for the users because we had a lot of respect for the for the already subscribers uh, that had to, uh, I mean we the first days during the state of alarm we used to have like let's say sixty complaints. But we had like 150 new subscri subscribers, so so we couldn't. I mean, we we didn't change this part uh, about the company. We had problems with with circulation. Obviously, we rely a lot on bars and uh, and uh, restaurants, and everything was closed. So we had a lot of problems with the circulation. But 
Uh, I mean, it, it has been hard. We all have people, very close people who has died and everything. But uh, from, from the um, business point of view, I think it has accelerated a lot of things uh, in just one year that maybe we had spent three or four years. This is my okay. point. And before we finish, I just want to uh, welcome Danielle. Daniela Aguitu from uh, Laura del Peliche, who's with us as well. And also Shalini Joshi, who's one of the founders of Kabbalaharia. So they're both, uh, they're both media organizations that we profile in the report. Super interesting in completely different you know, ways. Uh, Daniela, do you want to say, say anything? I mean, Daniela will speak on another panel, so we'll let you know, but please, do you want, would you like to? Uh, just a few words to, to say thank you very much to everybody. It was very, very, very interesting. Um, we are a very small uh, magazine who, uh, who wants to improve journalism old style <laughs> with a, a magazine, a, a paper magazine. And uh, we bet on our community who, who pay to uh, to have uh, our service and uh, we try to make their life a little bit better and if they uh, understand that um, they can improve a little bit very little bit their life thanks to us uh, they uh, they have no no problem to to sub sustain our, our our project so so thank you very much and uh, for the opportunity to be here. We are very, very proud. And uh, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. It's, it's such an interesting um, media. It's a 200 page magazine delivered quarterly. And I think you, you print around a thousand copies each time, is that right? And then have an online offering, which is completely different in between. And um, Daniela told me the story about how they see it as a, a small circle, but they dig a very deep hole. Yeah, and, of course. You know, the big issues for their community in this valley in Italy. So, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, uh, we are not able to dig a very, very big hole, but we want to, to go deep. So it, yeah. it will be a, a very small hole. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Well, we're kind of at the end. So does anyone have any like last questions or thoughts they want to share? I'll hand it back to Barbara now. But if you do, please speak up. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jackie. And thanks, everybody. This was really interesting what you have shared um, here today, but also um, all the what, what you had shared with Jackie before and is now incorporated in the in the report. Uh, um, for me, really, it was amazing to see the the, the energy and the passion that uh, the different journalists and editors that have contributed to the research put in their work, and and it's really their dedication to the community, their dedication also very much to gaining the trust of the community as a, as a as a mean to to. To, to do good journalism and to also be successful uh, financially. So it's, it's, a, it's a great, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great report, but it's also, if you want, you know, it's not the final product. We look forward, as Jackie mentioned, we will have many other events on this. We will try to um, showcase other cases, other examples of successful um, or innovative uh, local news organizations. And we very much hope that you will join those conversations to, 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 to continue with us to understand how can we contribute to supporting the efforts that you guys are doing and which are so important. We, we, I think the, the word news desert hasn't been mentioned yet, but we all know how, how uh, damaging they are to our communities. So, so this is what local news is really, uh, uh, very important for um yes so 
read the report <laughs> let us know if you have any comments let us know and mm. and uh, and we will continue doing research in this area and uh, come back to our next events on these topics thank you so much to everybody sarah dana thomas uh, raga and mira and everybody else and thank you jack thank you thanks everyone thank you, thank you.